Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amherst Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations, uh, Connecticut League of Museums. And we are so pleased to welcome you today to the first in a series of two programs that we're hosting in collaboration with Connecticut Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, Emily Garfinkel, our membership and programs manager um, at the League is also here with us and will be manning the recording and monitoring the chat for your questions as you have them um, and sending out a follow-up email afterwards with um, more information and resources for you, um, including a link to the recording Recording and we're going to get the slides from our presenters today. Um, but uh, I just wanted to uh, introduce, um, remind folks that this is the first in a series of two. So um, if you haven't signed up for next week's program, um, we'll also be uh, having a follow-up discussion with our friends from NEH about um, They'll go over a few grant lines that are specifically well suited to smaller organizations. But without further ado, I want to introduce our presenters here this week and also next week. We have with us Trisha Brooks, who's a senior program officer with the Division of Public Programs at NEH, and Adriana Cutler, who's a senior program officer in the Division of Preservation and Access at the NEH. Um, and I'm sure Trisha and Adriana will go over all of the divisions of the NEH and how it's organized and things like that. Um, but with intro to the NEH for smaller organizations, I'm pleased to hand things over um, to the two of them for their presentation. Um, Jason. Hey, Amherst, yeah. yeah, Amherst, if I could just... Um, Please do. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see you here earlier. So I know that you're running around from programs just like me today. So yeah, no, no worries. I just, Let me stop um, the screen share just for a second. So... Um, let me introduce Jason Mancini, who's the executive director of Connecticut Humanities and probably a face that's well known to many of you. Jason, thank you for being here. Thanks, Amaris. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to welcome Trisha Brooks, um, who I had the pleasure of meeting last week in Boise, Idaho at the AASLH conference. Um, it's a wonderful intersection of the work that we all do and, and how we uh, at Connecticut Humanities hope to sort of work and play together with uh, our grantees and uh, the league as well as NEH. So um, for those of you on the call who have received a Connecticut Humanities grant and any of the consults that you've done with uh, Scott or Leanne or Becky, um, you know, our goal has really always been to support the work that you do and encourage you to seek other kinds of funding from organizations like NEH. So it's really a pleasure to have uh, Tricia uh, here um, uh, and uh, to be able to present the work uh, that NEH does um, and look forward to learning uh, along with you. Um, so thank you all for being here um, and happy to hand it back. Great. And thank you so much, Jason. I also am seeing on my screen um, the grants team from Connecticut Humanities. So if you want to give a wave, um, and I don't know if you want to unmute and say a few words yourself, we have Scott Wands, Becky Vitkowskis, and Leanne Partridge from the grants team at Connecticut Humanities with us as well. Thanks, everybody. We won't take any more time, but just um, you know, we're the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, so all the grant work that you're going to be hearing about this week and next week are what happens at the federal level, and we're here to support your work as your state humanities council um, with resources, connections, and, of course, our grants and, and programs and all the work that we do out of our offices in our partnership with the Connecticut League. So very much looking forward to this, and um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, and thank you for your help um, in organizing this and pulling this together. All right, um, I'm gonna hand things over to Trisha and Adriana now um, for their presentation. If you have any questions as we go, please feel free to pop them in the chat. If there's something really on point, we'll bring it to their attention right away, um, but otherwise we'll try and hold questions for the end um, and we have should have plenty of time for those. Take it away. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adriana Cutler, as was mentioned before, um, and, and very thankfully joined here by, by Trisha Brooks, uh, who's 
just recently um, um, become the deputy director of our division of public programs. So, so you get an even higher level view there. Um, and we're just very happy to be here. And thank you so much for having us. Um, you know, big hello, of course, to, to Connecticut Humanities. Always love working with our uh, our state partners. Um, but thanks. And we'll uh, go over the agenda real quick and uh, then sort of get into uh, what we're going to do today. So um, we're going to take probably about give or take 45 minutes. Uh, we'll just briefly go into sort of what is any age for folks who are sort of new to our agency, uh, sort of the general overview of um, NEH funding, our divisions, what each one funds, uh, then looking at sort of how do you find what the right grant program is for you and sort of understand what that grant program is about, and then uh, dive deeper into the application process. Uh, we'll be looking at both how like the, some of the technical aspects of applying using um, forms, but then also sort of the real meat and potatoes of the applications, uh, which is all of the sort of wonderful writing that you all put together in these uh, proposals. Then we'll uh, briefly discuss the review process and go over some uh, quick tips for success. And then of course, let you know how you can contact us. So about any age, we're an independent federal agency. So of course that means we are uh, funded uh, via your tax dollars. Um, we support projects that engage humanities ideas and approaches. And um, in fiscal year 2022, we awarded over 136 million grants. And that's throughout all of our funding categories, including to the uh, state humanities councils which actually receive about 40% of NEH's overall funding every year. Our current chair is Shelly Lowe. She is from the Navajo Nation and um, has also a former uh, National Humanities Council member. You'll learn a little bit more about what the council is uh, later on in the presentation. So what are the humanities? Um, this is always sort of an interesting question because sometimes folks confuse, you know, the humanities and humanitarian work. And so we like to sort of just give a, a brief overview of that. Um, you know, the humanities is the idea of sort of publicly, public and scholarly study of human society and culture. Um, our Congress defined the humanities in 1965 uh, when the agency was established. And their definition includes history, literature, art history, philosophy, archaeology, religion, jurisprudence, and the humanistic social sciences. So we have a, a few examples on this slide. And kind of the way I like to think about it is, um, you know, history of. So anytime you're thinking about, you know, is this humanities? Well, if you're talking about uh, art history, it's still humanities. If you're talking about the history of science and technology, that's still humanities. So we really sort of run the gamut of all the different kinds of things that you could be thinking about when we're looking at the humanities. And, and that also includes all of the material culture that you're gonna find that document all of that. So, you know, if there are any um, art museums listening in, you know, your art objects themselves are considered um, humanities objects. So in terms of NEH funding, we um, we enable individuals and institutions across the US to study, preserve, and share the best of American history and culture. Um, we do give funding to primarily to organizations. So that's why you all are here today. We also do give uh, some funding to individuals through our division of research. Uh, so if there are sort of folks looking for individual funding in terms of research projects or book projects, we're not going to go too into depth into that today or in the next presentation uh, because we really are focused on organizations, but just for folks to be aware that um, that is also a, a possibility and to feel free to contact us if you have questions there. Uh, also wanted to uh, just let folks know about our American Tapestry Initiative. So uh, this is a new initiative um, that started last year. And it's, um, you know, as the only federal agency dedicated to funding the humanities, uh, this initiative, American Tapestry, weaving together past, present, and future, will leverage the humanities to strengthen our democracy, advance equity for all, 
and address our changing climate. So American Tapestry is about encouraging projects that elevate the role of civics in schools and public programs, promote media literacy, and use robust humanities research to examine threats to our democracy. Uh, this program will also build capacity in museums, libraries, archives, historic sites, cultural centers, and colleges and universities, uh, benefiting more communities while amplifying the untold stories of historically underrepresented groups. Um, this will further NEH's longstanding commitment to support tribal nations, community colleges, historically Black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions. Uh, finally, American Tapestry will promote climate resilience in the cultural and educational sectors and encourage humanities research into the human toll of climate change, exploring its historical roots and cultural effects. So by supporting humanities projects that align with these priorities, American Tapestry will elevate the country's history in all its complexity and diversity. And sorry, I should have mentioned at the top, I'm getting over some really bad allergies. So excuse my, my hoarse voice and if I take a sip of water here or there. And just one note about American Tapestry to add to what Adriana said is, um, this is an area where the agency has been able to open up some more grant opportunities for smaller organizations. So when we talk next week, much of what we talk about will be new programs and, and other programs that are being enhanced because of this American Tapestry initiative that Chair Lowe has started. Thanks, Trisha. So areas of funding. Um, we're going to go over sort of the five main areas of funding for uh, smaller organizations. Um, we do also have uh, a few other um, uh, divisions. Uh, we do have, uh, of course, our um, Office of Research, but they're mostly focused on um, funding for individuals. And then, of course, there is our, our Fed State Office who fund the State Humanities Councils. Um, so that's why you don't see them here on this list. But we did want to go over sort of the main um, divisions. And, and this is really the way NEH is, is, is split up. We kind of have these sort of main charges in these offices and sort of our grant funding is all based sort of within these, these offices. So, um, you know, as we're going through this, and then of course, as we're speaking next week about certain programs, you know, it's important to note that um, you might have projects that, um, you know, cross these divisions that maybe you have a project that um, components of it could be funded in, in one division and one grant line, and, and then another component could be funded through another grant line in another division. So just sort of to, to have a sense of, of, of where our funding comes from. So the, the first area of funding we'll just discuss is challenge programs. Uh, this is a program to strengthen the institutional base of the humanities through matching grants to build capacity and have long-term impact. And um, I just want to note, this is our only uh, sort of our, our, our challenge funding uh, programs are the only ones where there is a match required. Uh, it depends on the program and it depends on the um, amount of funding being requested, what that match ratio is. But technically it's the only funding program or, or set of funding programs in all of NEH where you must have an institutional match or must, must, the organization must find matching funds. Through none of our other programs is matching required. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. Uh, so then we have our um, Office of Digital Humanities, and they're focused on uh, nurturing, developing new methods that involve digital aspects of humanities research and dissemination. And, and the key here is new methods. So this is not necessarily where you would go for, you know, a project to digitize your collections or a project to, um, to uh, focus on, um, you know, creating a, uh, a, a you know a, a, an app with a walking tour or something like that. Use, so using digital technology does not necessarily mean the Office of Digital Humanities. We have digital technology and projects that deal with, with um, digital methods throughout the agency. It's really just that the Office of Digital Humanities is more about new methods and, and research in, in that aspect. Um, our Office of Education programs, 
strengthens teaching and learning in the humanities through professional development and innovative curricular programs. Um, while this uh, office is generally focused um, towards uh, universities and colleges, they do also have funding programs uh, that um, work with historical organizations that are putting together uh, programs for teachers, either in K through 12 or at the university level. Uh, so it's also worth looking into um, to their programs as well as uh, humanities organizations outside of um, the, the university spectrum. Uh, and then, of course, the preservation and access, which is my division. And so we like to think of ourselves as sort of the underpinning of of everything that goes on, because we are really about preserving and providing access to cultural and educational resources. So the idea is, you know, all of the the um, the the humanities uh, materials that are out there in your libraries, you have um, manuscripts, uh, paintings, archaeological artifacts, all of the all of the things that are, are necessary to document um, our history those are what can be uh, preserved and, and made accessible through preservation and access funding. And so then all of that then, of course, becomes what is used for um, everything that sort of goes up the chain, your research projects, your educational programs, your public programs. And so, um, you know, we think like to think of ourselves sort of the base of the pyramid. And then, of course, we have public programs, the wonderful public programs that really is providing the opportunities for public engagement, lifelong learning um, through museum exhibits, community engagement projects, documentaries, uh, podcasts, all sorts of media and digital projects um, really that helps to interpret uh, all of the, the history and, and make it um, interesting and exciting and understandable for the general public. And so um, before we get into sort of how you find grants and, and all of those things. We did just want to do a brief uh, information on organizations we fund or really what we think of as eligibility, um, because sometimes some folks may not realize that they are eligible for funding or may think they are, but but they need to, to maybe adjust some things first. So um, really the, the key is to know that it must be a not-for-profit organization uh, registered with the federal government. So typically a 501c3 registration. Um, as well, we do fund state and local government agencies, accredited colleges and universities, and federally recognized tribal government agencies. So these are sort of the main four buckets of organizations that we fund. And, Adriana, uh, before you move on to the next slide, there are just yeah. a couple of eligible, eligibility questions that have Absolutely. already been in. Um, what about state recognized tribes? Yes, I believe so. Um, you know, I might actually need to double check on that, but okay. as, if... If the state recognized tribe, yeah, I would imagine the state recognized tribes are um, also if they have any sort of like nonprofit status, like if they also have a registered 501c3, then they would also be eligible. But that is a great question. And I think one that um, I will make sure to double check on and we can sort of, you know, give a, a definitive answer in, in the uh, information that we send out. They do great, need thanks. to have, if, they, if it's a state recognized tribal government organization, it does need to have registration as a 501c3 okay. or other nonprofit registration in order to be eligible to yeah. any age. Thanks, Trisha. Great. There was another question that had come in, which I think actually is less about organizational eligibility and will probably be more about um, topic and type of grant. Um, but when we were talking about the humanities, there was a question about like our choruses considered a part of the humanities. So this is a kind of like performing arts, but if a chorus were a 501c3 that wanted to apply for a project that was not just an artistic performance, but that had that interpretive humanities aspect, I would imagine that that would be something that might be fundable. And that would be more, less a question of the or type of organization itself, but rather the type of programming exactly. or effort that they wanted to fund. Absolutely. It's really about the project. Um, we absolutely have funded performing arts organizations, um, but it is typically either, um, you know, preserving and making accessible their collections, or um, it is about, you know, educational programming that they might have in concert with the performances that's really going into history and, and information about um, uh, 
about, you know, either, for example, um, I'm trying to think, we, I know that we just recently found in Trisha, you might know this one better, better than I, because I, it came out of, out of your, your division, but I know that at least Houston Opera um, just received an award uh, and they are, they have an opera that they are creating um, programming around uh, to, because it is a, it is an opera that deals with historical topics and historical themes. And so they want to do um, educational programming, uh, talk back sessions, um, different, different, uh, you know, sessions around, you know, before and after the operas that will really delve into the historical components of, of the opera. Um, I, I don't know if you, you have that, that one off the top of your head, Trisha, but I, yes, um, yes, I know no, that you're one. right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And what I would say is it's a great question because um, there are two pieces of the question that I think are really helpful. One is organizationally, we fund more than just organizations that would be considered strictly humanities organizations. So for example, in, in my division off the top of my head, I can think of social service agencies that we funded and I can think of science organizations that we funded, for example. But it is again, as Adriana said, the, about the project. So if you're an arts organization, a science organization, et cetera, and you're doing a project that's grounded in humanities scholarship, then that's what we will be concerned with. And the other piece of it is about arts because there is a tricky line <laughs> between the arts and the humanities. And um, we do have some restrictions around what we can fund when it comes to things that are arts. So we fund essentially the interpretation of the arts. So we fund art history, but we do not fund art creation. So we also can't fund performance. So with the Houston Opera example, we would not be able to fund the performance of the opera, but we can fund the discussion and, and the exploration of the cultural issues that are raised in the opera. Um, I hope that makes sense, but if people have questions about it, I invite them to ask more. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and just a reminder too, there's also, um, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts is our sister agency. So if uh, you are an art organization that's more interested in um, some of the other aspects of art making, um, then they, they are worth uh, speaking with. And of course, they are, um, every state has an Arts Council, just as it has a, a yes. State Humanities Council, and they are also another great resource. So. All right, so we've talked a little bit about what the NEH funds. So now the big question is, how in the world do you figure out what grant program at the NEH to apply to? We have a ton of grant programs. So how do you identify what program is right for your project? The first place to start, I would say, would be our website. And when you come to our website right now, this is what you will see, um, but you can see in the upper right-hand corner, there are some menu items and the arrow here is pointing to grants. So if you click on grants as the menu selection, you come to this page where you then have the option to search for grants in various different ways. So first of all, you can search all grant programs, which will bring you to a list of all of our grant programs, just a straight up list of every one of our grant programs. But it also will give you the option to search. You can add filters to that list. So you can filter by um, division or office. And you can also filter by whether or not the grant program is currently open and accepting awards. I, I, I mean, excuse me, applications. Um, what might help you a little bit more than that, if you have some sense, for example, that 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 you have a particular kind of project that you wanna do, what might be more helpful is this option right here, match your project to a grant program. When you click on that, you'll get a list of questions, of, of statements, um, statements, about things that you might be thinking about doing. This is the top of the list. So these all happen to be really about projects individual scholars might be working on. 
uh, but you can read through, scroll down, scroll through the list, look at the different questions that are available. There are questions like, I want to interpret a historic place or um, statements like, I want to preserve, digitize and or make collections accessible. So you find the one that might speak most to, to what you're thinking about doing. And this little arrow right here, when you click on that, what you get, I've scrolled further down the page, I want to preserve, digitize, and or make a collection accessible. I click on the arrow and I see a list of some possible grant programs that might match my project. And all of these are links that will bring you to further information about that grant program. So if you click on one of these links, it brings you to what we refer to as the landing page for the grant program. And this is just one example of a grant program that is offered at the NEH for um, awards for research to faculty members. And this is particularly for awards to research at Hispanic serving institutions. But each of our grant programs has a page just like this, where you'll find a description on the left side of the page directly under the grant title. There's a description that is going to tell you the major sort of mission of the grant program. It's gonna give you a little bit of an overview of what that grant program would fund. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see the grant snapshot. So this gives you some of the kind of major key information that you're gonna, going to want to have sort of right off the bat when you're organizing your thinking about applying for the grant program. So things like how much money can you ask for? Um, it's going to tell you when the application is available. I mean, the application is due, but it's also going to tell you when the application is available, meaning that some of our grant programs, when you go to the website, you'll see a notice that says, this opportunity has already passed. Well, the opportunity has passed, but we will be coming up on another, um, another period of offering that grant and we need to update the information about it. So uh, generally speaking, two to three months before the deadline is when all of that updated information will become available and the grant program will be opened to start accepting applications. So that application available date is when you can expect to be able to find the updated information and the application becoming available. Most of our grant programs, but not all of them, will offer you the opportunity to submit a draft of your application in advance for a program officer to review it and to provide you with feedback. So if the grant program offers that option, then you will find a date when that draft would be due to be turned into us for us to be able to have the chance to review it prior to the application deadline. So then you find the application deadline, but you also find the expected notification date. So that is around the time when we will let all of the applicants know the result of the review. And then there's also the project start date, which refers to the time frame during which we would expect you to begin working on the project. So in this example, the application notification date is listed as December 31st, 2023. That means that we expect to be able to tell you whether or not you would receive award around, around that time of year, but we wouldn't expect you to start working on that project until sometime between January 1st and September 1st. In your application, you would pick a date uh, between that time frame for the start of your work plan in your application. So you would list out what you're planning to do starting on, let's say, January the 1st uh, in order to complete that application. I mean, to complete the project if you're funded. And if I could uh, just interject real quick, Tricia, I would just also recommend when looking at that sort of project start date, 
Um, you know, if the expected notification date is December 31st, I would actually recommend not putting your start date at January 1 because it sometimes takes our Office of Grants Management, who are the folks that kind of do all of the paperwork and processing to make sure to like get your award documents out and everything. It might take them a little bit of time, depending on um, the time of year and the amount of awards that we're putting out at that time. So it's sometimes good to give yourself a little bit of a buffer um, just because we don't want you to a have a project start date that then, of course, you know, we at the agency might be missing that time frame and then you're having to start later or, you know, one that, um, you know, then means that your project start date is, is is earlier and then that means your project end date is earlier. But then if you're not really getting everything started until later, it becomes, a, a you know, just more logistics to push the project dates. So just just a heads up that that sometimes it's good to give yourself a little bit of a buffer. And then also in terms of how it then impacts other potential projects that are connected to that project down the road. And and generally speaking, I think uh, um, most applicants continue working on their project while it's being reviewed with us. Our review process is long. So usually, you know, you're looking at, in this case, the application deadline was, was April the 12th and the applicant won't find out until December whether or not they received an award. So oftentimes during that time, uh, applicants are continuing to move the project forward. And so that project start date is really about when you start working on the activities that you're outlining in your application that you would do under the grant program during the, the period of an award. Um, there are There is going to be a little bit of back and forth with any age around that that Adriana was just describing. And if you don't receive the grant paperwork by the time of your start date, there's still it's, it's it's not the end of the world, we'll just say. So if you do choose January 1st, um, it, it's and, not the end of the world. It just can be a little bit of a delay for you if you need to be able to access the funds from any age in order to be able to uh, in, in order to be able to move things forward with the project. Um, yeah, that, that's a great point. Yeah. Been, and, 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 and oftentimes if if you know we, if our grants management staff realizes that okay, we're, we're not going to make this date that we had listed. You know, we can adjust some of those dates even prior to the to the official award, uh, so that, that that can be adjusted. Um, also, I wanted to mention really quickly, um, as Trisha noted, you know, our our active applications tend to come out two to three months before the uh, the deadline. But because many of our funding programs are annual offerings or biannual offerings, you can still look at the um, information and as what, what we're going to go into in a little bit, the notice of funding opportunity, the guidelines. You can look at the previous version um, that is still available online. And we often recommend folks do that as early as possible. Because some of these uh, programs, you know, can and applications can take a little bit of time to really get all your, get everything together. And so it's, it's worth looking at the previous versions. Um, you know, we try to highlight whatever might have changed from version to version. And a lot of the times there are small changes. Um, and even if sometimes if they're big changes, they're typically ones that are maybe making the program a little more expansive rather than restricting things. And so, um, you know, we, we try to, to make it so that you understand what the changes are it's always good to, of course, then once that new active application comes out to look at that, but it's very worthwhile to look at the current version that's out uh, to just get started and get thinking. Yes, it's never too early to start and it's never too early to contact us to ask questions. Yes. I've been talking to people for three, four years who are still working on an application because they're still trying to decide exactly how they want to shape their their project and i'm fine with talking to them even though they haven't applied yet and i've been talking to them for several years it's fine so some other resources that you will find as you scroll down on that 
that landing page for the grant program, there are other significant resources that you will find. The first one being the Notice of Funding Opportunity, which we will talk about in more detail later, as Adriana just noted. And that is basically like your manual to the grant program and to preparing your application. Um, we also have a link to grants.gov. Grants.gov is a federal website where all of our grant applications have to be submitted. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. And some of the other resources that can be really helpful include a lot of the programs have a frequently asked questions document. It's a great thing to look at because you can bet that if you have a question, someone else probably had that same question before. So that's a great place to look for some answers. Um, recent awards lists are really helpful. If you're trying to determine whether or not a project fits in a particular grant program, looking at the recent awards list can give you some clues about the kinds of things that are funded and that do well and that fit well in that grant program. The other thing that can give you some great clues about that are our sample application narratives. Those can give you really good ideas, not just about what gets funded, but about what works in an application. So these are past successful applications. Uh, usually it's the part of the application we call the narrative. Sometimes there may be other pieces of the application in, in the division of public programs. There are some other pieces of the application that we sometimes can post as well. And looking at these, gives you a good sense of the kinds of things that work in, in responding to what we're asking for from you in a grant narrative. All right, so, you know, once you have a sense of which funding program you wanna apply for, or maybe even before, while you're still deciding which funding program you wanna apply for, there's a few places that you'll need to register to be able to actually submit that application. So as Trisha said, all of our um, applications come through the grants.gov portal, but to get into the grants.gov portal, first your organization has to create a login.gov account, then a SAM.gov account, which is System for Award Management. Uh, you have to get a, it's called a UEI user, I forgot. I forgot what the E stands for, but the identification Unique number basically. Entity identifier. Thank you. Unique, Unique entity, identity identifier. entity identifier. This is basically replacing previously people were using the Dun & Bradstreet number. Um, this has replaced that. Um, and so I think for some folks that might've already been in the system, there was an automatic transition. But if you've never applied for um, a grant through grants.gov before, if you don't have a SAM.gov account, then you'll be starting fresh with a new UEI. So all of these, um, you know, take a little bit of time to to um, to go through and to get submitted. It can take between a minimum of two weeks for each of these, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of registrations to go through. Sometimes it can take a little bit longer. So it's sort of great. The earlier you start in terms of getting these registrations in, the better. And just to iterate, reiterate, it is always free to register and apply for federal grants. You will see scams out there telling you, oh, pay this money to apply for these grants or, oh, pay this money to get your grant stock of login. Those are all scams. We take no money. We only give money. <laughs> yep. I see somebody that just posted in. Don't, don't. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Marissa. The, don't, don't fall for those scam renewal scams. Don't. We, we do not accept your money. We only like to give it. So um, so just to, to note that you want to start with this now, uh, you know, even, even before you've decided which funding program you're going to apply for, because this also works not just for NEH, it works for NEA, it works for Institute of Museum and Library Services, any agency out there um, that is giving funding, National Park Service, you know, they, it, it's all going to come through grants.gov. So it's worthwhile to just get these registrations rolling. And just one thing about login.gov that is relatively new as well. So login.gov is a 
universal login that you can use over a number of cooperating federal agency websites. So it's one login. You don't have to have you know a different password and username for each one of these different websites. But if the website uses login.gov, you have to use login.gov. So you'll have to set up that login.gov account in order to, to get into set up your SAM.gov account. And these are, this is a progression. So it is login.gov. You've got to get that first and then you can get into SAM. <laughs> and then you've got to wait until your SAM registration is completed. And as Adriana said, what minimum of two weeks, generally speaking, but it can take longer. And then you can get into the grants.gov um, account to, to create that. And you should check if you already have these things set up, you should check and make sure that they are active because SAM registration does expire. So that has to be renewed. And then grants.gov, they will make your your account inactive if you haven't used it and I think it's I think it's 12 months they will make it inactive and you will just have to reactivate it yeah and thank you Trisha and also um for the login.gov email address that you use it does have to be a unique email address so it can't be like a general email address that everybody in the agency is using or or everybody in your organization is using it they do need to be unique um addresses and um so and but i will say with grants.gov um when you go to their website you can start looking at all of the forms so we're going into the required application components this is the list of, of application components that are found oh i'm sorry can you get things um that that is found on the grants.gov web page so when you go to um you know the the link out from our our program page to grants.gov it will take you to the grants.gov page for that program it will show you the list of forms that are required to submit your proposal and so even if you're still getting everything reactivated you can start working on some of these um, these forms and, and collecting your information, even if you can't submit yet. So don't think that like you can't even look at anything or start working on your application before you've you've completed the login SAM and grants.gov registrations or reactivations. You can start working on things. You just won't be able to submit until all of that is complete. So um, in for the sort of grants.gov package, some of the sort of basic forms that are necessary for all of our funding programs. There's the SF-424 application for federal domestic assistance, supplementary cover sheet, project performance. And so some of these might be a little different products or performance site location, research and related budget. Um, there's a few of our programs do have maybe one or two extra forms specific to that program that you'll also see. Uh, and then the attachment form. So the attachment form is basically where you're going to be attaching all of the documentation and all of the things that we ask for in our notice of funding or guidelines. So it's your narrative, all of the things that are going to be on the next slide. Uh, but I wanted to just go over really quick. This is our supplementary cover sheet for NEH programs. And I just wanted to, to mention, because this is something that we see folks sometimes have trouble with, because you know, nothing can be easy where the whole world uses the same terminology for everything. And so NEH is a little funny with our terminology or federal programs in general, in terms of what we call matching, you know, what we mean by matching funds and then what we mean by cost sharing. Um, so a lot of folks think of matching funds as cost share and is the same thing in a lot of private, um, you know, funding and organizations. At any, it's just a little different. Um, so when you are applying to one of our funding programs, say it's a funding program that has a maximum of $350,000. And so you're going to request you know, $350,000 for your project. And so if you're requesting that amount of funding from us, you would put that under outright funds. That means those are funds that we're just giving to you. You don't have to match anything. You don't have to provide any extra funds. You know, we're just giving... That's the that's that's what you've asked for. That's what we're giving. Federal match is if is you know often used in our challenge programs where you do have to have matching funds, or 
you may want to use matching funds. But again, I, I don't know that it, it doesn't have any uh, bearing on competitiveness to use federal matching funds. So I wouldn't necessarily, you know, recommend it one way or the other. Um, it's just if you want to, you know, have some of your funds, say you were going to request, you know, 200 in outright funds and then 150 in federal match, that would mean we would give you the 200,000 if you, if you received an award, you know, we would just, you would get that. If you requested 150 in federal match, that means that you have to find outside funders that are going to match that amount. So you have to show us that you've been able to raise 150,000 and 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 sort of prove that to us, and then we would release those funds. Um, so again, that's really more relevant for our challenge programs where you must federal match. Most of our other programs don't require it. Cost sharing is again. You can show this, but it's not required. Cost sharing is basically say you're requesting three hundred and fifty thousand from us, but your project's really going to cost like you know four hundred thousand. Um, but our max amount that we that that we can give you is three fifty. So you might show in cost sharing, oh, we're going to cost share this. In, we call it institutional cost share. Our institution is putting up the other fifty thousand to complete the budget. Again, it's not required. Even if you know that that's going to be the case, it's not required to show it to us. Sometimes that actually gets a little more complicated in the budget. So it's really up to you whether or not you want to show it. Again, it has no bearing on competitiveness of the application. But just sort of wanted to clarify, because sometimes folks will put like, really, they mean outright funds. They want to receive the 350, you know, not matched, and they put it in federal matching by mistake. So just... You know, we, we try to catch those things as they come in. It's not like, oh, if you did it, oh, now you're doomed. But, um, you know, we just want to make sort of clarify that as folks um, apply. But um, anyway, so going into sort of what I was starting to say before about the attachment form, which is where you sort of put all of the information that is really um, NEH focused uh, informa information that NEH is really asking you for the program. So that's getting into our next slide. But before we leave this oh, one, sure. let me um, quick highlight one thing that Adriana said about matching funds. And that is that federal matching funds have to come from a third party. And, and it's really important to understand that it can't be very different from cost share. It can't just be, oh, well, we're going to put in this amount of money, federal matching funds mean that you are going out and you are raising those funds for programs where it is not required to request matching funds. If you do request matching funds, it's generally a one-to-one -one match. So you ask for 150,000 in matching funds, you have to raise 150,000. In our challenge grant programs, oftentimes it's a higher match ratio than that. You have to raise $3, for example, for every $1 that you would get from any age. And I will also add that um, while matching funds are not required in most of our programs and matching funds are not a matter of competitiveness, as Adriana pointed out, that was a really important point to make. Um, the reason why I sometimes would encourage someone to ask for matching funds would be in a case where they know that they have a donor who's going to give them more money if they can say to them, we can't get this $150,000 from NEH unless we raise $150,000. And they know that that donor who would normally say have given them 20,000 will now give them 50,000. So think carefully about that before asking for matching funds as well. There's and the other- Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. There's just a quick question on this matching point. Um, Kim asks, can state funds be used as matching funds? So if if you are getting an outside, let's say you're getting a grant from the state, is if, if that's what you mean, yes. If it means that your operating funds are partially state funds, the state every year gives you $10,000 towards your operating budget, then I then I would think no, those would not be be counted. It has right. to be some outside fundraising that you and, have and I believe that that anything that I believe state humanities council awards cannot be used as matching funds either. 
um, it, it really does have to be a non, uh, you know, sort of non-connected to any H entity. Thanks. And and just a quick note about the other forms that are listed here. They're they're basically general information about your grant. This is not getting into deep particulars. This is the SF-424. This is basic information about your grant program, uh, about your grant request rather. So it's your what organization is applying. Who is the project director on the award? You need to designate two different individuals when you apply to us. You need to designate a project director and a different person to be a grant administrator. And, um, and then the other thing on the application for federal domestic assistance that's a good tip to know is that there is a brief project description asked for on that form. It is limited to 1,000 characters, and that includes spaces. And you, you do want to think about what you say in those 1,000 characters, because we do use that description for a few different functions as we go through the review process. So don't just think, oh, I'm going to take the first paragraph of my uh, of my grant narrative and, and drop it into that description. Because sometimes that first paragraph of your grant narrative is more than 1,000 characters, including spaces. And then it gets cut off and your proposal is being presented with this on the front of it. So the, the thing that shows up on the very front of your proposal is going to be this short description. Um, yeah. Thank you, Trisha. And I'll also just note too, a, a tip for making sure that you're meeting those, that you're not going outside those thousand characters, because we all know Word likes to have a lot of hidden uh, stuff in it. Um, it. It'll have like hidden, hidden, um, not characters, but sort of hidden, hidden, hidden like coding within your text that can also impact that thousand characters. So it can be good to, you know, maybe you write it out in Word, but then you take that copy and paste it and putting it into like a blank notes a uh, uh, notes document, and then that will show up if there are any of these weird hidden characters and you can delete all of that. So just, just again, that, that thousand characters is, is, it can be frustrating because we all know that there's hidden coding in there. And so sometimes it's good to paste it into a notes type document that will show the hidden coding. You can delete all of that and make sure you're truly sticking within your thousand characters. And we're about to talk more, just FYI, about the research and related budget and the attachment form in, in essence, so. Yes, so that's really where you get to the meat of our application. So all of those other forms, you know, as, as Trisha said, they're, you know, they're pretty brief. They're more like logistical components, but the, um, you know, the, really the meat and potatoes is the, the, the attachments and, and the budget form. So, you know, in the notice of funding opportunity, which we also like to call the guidelines, that's really discussing what are the components of the application that you need to write out. So that's talking about the narrative. The narrative is the place where basically, you know, we are asking questions in, in these guidelines, in these notice of fundings, we are asking questions and the narrative is where you're going to be answering those questions. I highly recommend following the order um, that we ask the questions in. You can even put, you know, basically you don't have to put the exact question and then answer, but you can, you know, title each section sort of based on like the main component of what those questions are, um, are, are, are talking about and, and, and sort of break out your sections that way. It's just really important to follow the order uh, because when our outside panel reviewers are, are reading things, you know, they will have seen the, the, the guidelines that you saw, they're going to be expecting everything sort of in that order. Um, but the narrative really is where you're describing, you know, you're describing your need, you're describing the, the, your organization's project need, you're describing how the project is going to meet that need, you're going to be describing the audience that your project is 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 um, communicating with and tailed to, you're going to describe how you're going to connect with that audience. Um, you know, the methods that you're going to use to make all of this happen, uh, who, you know, you'll briefly probably describe who are the, the main, you know, people that are going to be working on the project um, and any sort of, you know, 
outcomes that you see for the project. So all of these kind, all of this information is going to be in that narrative. The questions that are asked, um, and sometimes the order is all going to be a little bit different for every single grant program. So it's really important when you're applying to a funding program to look at the specific guidelines, the specific notice of funding for that program. So make sure that you're answering the questions for that grant program. Uh, then, of course, there's the work plan. So sometimes within the narrative, we'll ask for a, a brief uh, description of your work plan, but then we also ask for a separate, more detailed uh, description of, <clears throat> excuse me, of how, how the project is going to happen. Uh, it's usually, sometimes people use Gantt charts, tables. It's important to show, you know, what work is happening, when it's happening, and who is responsible for that work. So that information is really critical in the work plan. Um, then we get into our participants. So um, you'll you'll probably within your narrative do a brief uh, information about some of the key participants for the project. But then we also ask for in most of our funding programs, and and again sometimes it's a little bit different how we ask for it on each funding program. But all of them will include at least a list of participants. That's going to include the your organizational staff that's working on the project as well as any um, outside scholars or consultants um, that might be working on the project if you have advisory boards that are being a part of the project who are those people um, and then also we like to know too if you have any letters that have been um, included uh, in, in the proposal either letters of commitment from folks they're going to be working on the project or letters of recommendation from people supporting the project, who those people are in your list of participants. Then we'll ask, depending on the program, for brief bios of, of, of many of these people, um, and especially for the staff and, and consultants and the main people working on the project, we'll ask for uh, resumes as well, too, but, you know, no more than two-page resumes for these folks. Uh, this is to allow... Um, our, our outside panel reviewers to really make sure that the folks working on the project have this have the the backgrounds and skills and requirements that you know would lead to success in in that uh, program. Uh, oh, I'm sorry oh, about that. That's okay. Um, but um, then of course other there's going to be other requirements based on each grant program. So again, you'll just want to you know go through that. Um, you know, for example, some of our funding programs may ask for um, you know, if you're in public programs, they might ask for a um, sort of a, a brief, uh, and, and Trisha, I'm, I'm blanking on the project terminology. Walk through, for Thank example, you. A project walkthrough. If you're doing an exhibition, you describe how someone is going to experience the exhibition. Or, or if it's a documentary, you might have like a, um, a brief description of the components of the documentary. But, yeah, but basically you're just going to want to look at what is required for each grant program. It can be very different. It can be as simple, for example, with participants as brief bios um, of those participants. So every grant program is going to have slightly different documents that you have to uh, submit and they should be submitted as part of that attachment form. The attachment form is basically just a list of, we tell you what to name the the document in the notice of funding opportunity it tells you what to name the document and then you just attach it to that yep. and it tells you what order to put it in yeah. and i will say this too because sometimes folks are not sure if they need to lump sections together which sometimes it's good to do because sometimes you're going to need to combine um you know all of the resumes into one attachment because I think I think the attachment form has like 12 or 16 yeah. openings and just it depending on, you know, how many pages you have, you might need to sort of combine them um, and, and so that you can sort of put them properly into those slots. So I, I'm going to um, give you the uh, wrap it up sign because we need to move on. But... Sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah, but so, of course, everything is, is submitted through Grants.gov. And all documents have to be PDF. And I'm actually going to say they have to be flat PDFs. They can't be like PDF folders with extra stuff in them. They have to be a flat PDF. Otherwise, even though the grants.gov system will accept an application that has a Word doc or an Excel form, um, 
our system at any age will reject those fonts. So just always make sure that all the attachments are flat PDFs. So in the notice of funding opportunity, um, which is really where you get you know, the main information about what to apply for, just a few highlights. The first section, section A is gonna give you a program description that's gonna tell you in greater depth the mission of the program and sort of what are the kinds of activities it's looking to fund. Um, section C will go to eligibility information. And so some of the things we've already discussed, eligible applicants, cost sharing, section D application and submission information. This is the real meat and potatoes. It's the content and form. This is what I was saying. You know, these are the questions. Um, you also want to skip down to section six. And as, as you see, they're not all in order. We have section one and section six. These are very long bureaucratic, uh, uh documents. And so um, we're trying to sort of show you what are the most critical components. There's going to be a lot of extra fuzziness, especially if there's a lot of information there about the budget and how to fill out the budget and what goes in the budget. So that's what you're going to see in some of these in between sections one and six. Well, um, it, that's in section one, actually. It's, <laughs> budget, it was even budget. further, but it's, it's long. pages. But yeah. that content and form section includes the specifics that Adriana was saying. You want to write your narrative in the order that um, we list the information. So it gives you the specifics of what we want to see in the narrative and, and what we want to see in each of the required documents and the very specifics of that budget. It gives you very clear directions for how to fill out that budget form. Yes. And then section six is important. It's always you know, as you're figuring out what your project is going to be from the beginning, look at Section 6 funding restrictions because every program has a list of funding restrictions, things that we can't fund. So we try to explain what we do fund at the top, but some of those, you know, some of those things, it's sort of a, it sometimes is a little more open-ended because we want to see what you're going to come to us with sometimes. You know, we, we, we like to try to, sometimes it's very clear, but sometimes it's a little more open-ended because we're trying to leave things open for there might be interesting projects that we hadn't even thought of a ways of doing things and you're going to be able to present that to us. But funding restrictions is important because that'll tell you what we absolutely cannot fund in any particular program. And then of course, review criteria is critical. This is how your application is going to be reviewed. These are the exact review criteria that our outside panel reviewers look at um, to review your applications. And so it's important as you are going through the content and answering the questions, that we've asked you that you're also looking to the review criteria and in the notice of funding it tells you you know this these content questions connect to this review criteria this review criteria connects to these content questions so that you can sort of cross reference the two as you're writing your narrative and make sure did i answer all of the questions in the content section as well as what the review criteria is asking for and then at the bottom, of course, is the announcement and award dates. I will also add really quickly that many of um, our notice of funding opportunities will have, um, I think it's a section H that uh, might have additional resources and is a good place to sort of find links and, and other air places that you can look at for information um, about field resources that might be useful to, to you as you are working on an application. Okay. And then um, just we wanted to point out, you know, sort of scholars, advisors and consultants. So, um, you know, a lot of projects, of course, the, the, the your organization is going to be putting this project together. You're going to have, uh, you know, your your staff involved and it required in every one of our grant programs. You need to have somebody with subject matter expertise, somebody with technical expertise, and you have to include multiple perspectives and some of our programs um, require you to have some of these uh, needs met by outside advisors and consultants, and some do not. So it's really important to look at the requirements of each funding program, but every program requires this sort of constellation of expertise in and, and perspectives in the application. And so you'll just have to look at each funding program as to whether um, it's it, it's required to include outside uh, expertise or not. Sometimes even if it's not required, it's a really good idea and can be really helpful because of course, if your staff doesn't have that expertise, it'll be good to put it in there. 
So just very quickly to tell you a little bit about the application review process, we use a peer review process, which means that we ask for uh, outside reviewers, outside of the National Endowment for the Humanities, who are in people who are engaged in the type of work that's related to the application. So oftentimes it's a mix of subject area experts and experts who, in my division anyway, we refer to as practitioners. So that's people who do the kind of work that the application is proposing. So for example, for an exhibition application, we will have curators doing review. For, um, for a documentary film application, we'll have filmmakers just as an example. So we ask them to weigh in using that review criteria that Adriana just mentioned to share with us their perspective on the strengths and the weaknesses of the application. We take that information and we uh, present that to our National Council on the Humanities, which is 26 professionals from across the country who are all appointed by the president and they are confirmed by the Senate. Those 26 meet three times a year and they review what we have put before them in terms of the applications that we've received. They make recommendations for funding to our chair and Chair Lowe makes the final funding decisions. One of the best ways that you can possibly learn more about preparing an application and about what we look for in an application is to be one of those peer reviewers. These are people just like you who are engaged in the field, who are doing the work in the field that, that is being requested funding, that people are requesting funding to support. So if you're interested in being a peer reviewer, we are always looking for peer reviewers. Here is a link to how you can sign up to be a peer reviewer at uh, sec securegrants.neh.gov backslash sign up. Um, Please, if you do enter your name there, please be sure to enter some information about your background as well so that we have some sense of, of where you would fit as a reviewer and, and why we would ask you to review a per, on a particular type of review panel versus another type of review panel. And then just a few quick tips for success in applying to NEH. So you wanna find the right program. I talked a little bit about how you can use the website to do that, but one of the best ways to do that is to talk to us. So you identify on the website, you think that your project fits in a particular program, or you think that there may be two different ones that might fit in and you're trying to decide which one, call us. We will talk to you and we will tell you, oh yes, you have found the right program, or you know what, you might really want to think about this program over here. Let me refer you to my wonderful contact colleague, Adriana, and she can tell you a little bit more about it. Um, you want to read the Notice of Funding Opportunity. And after you've read the Notice of Funding Opportunity, and yes, it is, they are very long, you do want to read it again and read it very carefully and talk to us about it. Um, and very importantly, review that that review criteria and the notice of funding opportunity. That's in section E, part one of section E. Um, you wanna think about that and keep that in the front of your mind when you're writing your application, because that is exactly a pointed um, description of what we are going to be asking our reviewers to comment on. Um, you want to read some of the sample proposals and see what you notice across a few sample proposals. What do you notice about how they present their project? What commonalities do you see? And that can give you some tips about some best ways of approaching presenting your project to us. If it's allowed in the grant program, you want to submit a draft. We will review a draft. You, you should take advantage of that. It is an invaluable process to have that draft review and get that feedback from a program officer. You wanna make sure your writing is clear and concise. And very importantly, you wanna make sure that it presents a good grounded argument. You wanna ground that argument in, in humanity scholarship. You wanna ground that argument in, um, in the need for the project, but don't make the assumption that your argument is clear because for example, 
you are presenting an application about a topic that you know is really significant. You want to still state, why is this important? Um, why is this necessary? You want to include all of the required supporting materials. So the last thing on here says, pay attention to details. This is a place where you really wanna pay attention to detail. Make sure that you have submitted all of the required documents. If you do not submit all of the required documents, your application is likely to be deemed ineligible because it is incomplete. So make sure you've submitted everything. And, and I, sorry, if I can just interject really quick with that. Um, there is a chart in the Notice of Funding Opportunity that lists out which components are required, which are recommended, which are conditionally required. So you wanna make sure to follow that chart. And then um, also, also make sure not to go, there are page limit requirements um, and they're different for every program. So it's really critical not to go over the page limit because then again, your application, if it goes over the page limit, will be deemed ineligible and not reviewed. Yes, and all of that information can be found in section D, part two, in the Notice of Funding Opportunity. That's that content and form section. Make sure all your attachments, as Adriana explained, flat PDFs. I can't tell you how many times we see applicants submit and they have something that's not a PDF and the entire application is rejected on the basis of being in the wrong format because we can't read that. So make sure that everything is turned into a PDF and register early register now for SAM and for grants.gov. And then finally, the best thing you can do to help yourself is to contact the program officer. We are happy to talk to you. We will answer your questions about the grant program. We will offer you advice in preparing your application. We will read your draft. We will refer you to our colleagues. If, if you come to us and, and the projects you have is not a good match for the program that you thought, um, we will direct you to the right place. So please, please, please do contact us. Um, again, reminders, because we can't say it enough, start now. It's never too early to start thinking about applying, registering now for SAM, for grants.gov, carefully following the NOFO, submitting a draft and contacting us. We cannot say those things often enough, but now we do want to answer your questions. And I see there's a lot going on in the chat. We've been able to walk. Thanks so much. And I'm gonna go through these in order. I've been trying to um, keep track of the questions as they've come in. There are a few that we've been able to address either live um, or just with um, some links and reminders, um, but, uh, and, and some that I just kind of want to, that have been answered that I just want to elevate. There was a question that came through. Um, can you apply for more than one? And I think this is NEH grant at a time. Absolutely. The only caveat to this is with our office of challenge grants. So all other of our funding programs, you can apply to and receive awards in um, at the same time, as long as the uh, activities and budgets are not overlapping. But if they are distinct projects, distinct activities, distinct budgets, you can apply for and receive awards in all those programs. The caveat with any of our challenge programs, which are the, the ones that are full match programs, those you can only have either one open award or application at a time. But you can have a challenge award and apply to any of our other awards and receive those. So that's that's sort of the only um, caveat with that. But but yes, in general, you can apply for and receive awards in all of our programs at any given time. Great. Um, we've already clarified that one can have simultaneous grants from, for instance, Connecticut Humanities and the NEH at the same time. Um, CTH staff thankfully fielded that question yes, for us. Thank you. But again, as long as activities and budgets are not overlapping. 
Um, so it is true. I'm sorry. Um, if you apply to another federal agency, right. so you can have the same project receive funding from us and from the Institute for Museum and Library Services or from us and from the National Endowment for the Arts. But again, you can't have, you can't ask two federal agencies to support the same exact activities that are involved in that project. No double dipping, right? No you can't double charge dipping. it to two institutions. I Hopefully that's all just good budgeting, but worth saying. Um, so uh, there were some questions um, related to eligibility and project fit. Um, so I'm going to go through those next. Um, there was a question about um, if a nonprofit is trying to put together a multicultural day with performances, would something like that be eligible for support or, or perhaps what portions of such an event might be eligible for support from NEH? So I'm going to approach this as if this is coming to my division of public programs. So first and foremost, the division of public programs supports projects that interpret, that, that provide audiences with analytical interpretation grounded in humanities scholarship. So you would have to be as part of your multicultural day providing, let's say, uh, programming that explores ideas about the uh, various different cultures through a means other than performance, because we can't fund the performance part. It can be part of your project, and it can be a part of your project that helps form a strength of the project. It's just that any H funds wouldn't be able to be used to pay musicians or to pay dancers or actors to perform, but if you wanted to have um, something where, let's say, you talk about uh, you talk about the cultural origins of the dance that was performed, or the cultural meanings behind the the music and the songs, that is something that you could apply to us for. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope folks in this, we, we just had a, a kind of Grants 101 session with Connecticut Humanities a couple of weeks ago. I hope folks are hearing the resonances here in terms of what NEH and CTH can fund, what is considered sort of humanities, and what falls outside the fund, because there's parallels for obvious reasons here. Um, there's a question um, that's more kind of like on the acceptance rate thing. Um, what percentage of applicants receive grants? Like how competitive is it to get an NEH grant? And I, this may vary by funding opportunity, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that to help folks understand a little bit what that landscape looks like and how competitive it is. It does vary by funding opportunity. It does. And, and it varies greatly. Um, you know, we have some programs where, you know, they're very competitive, the funding ratio, you know, might be like 15%. And we have other funding programs, some of which we'll be talking about next week, where our funding ratio is close to 50%. So um, it, it really does vary a lot. And so it's important to sort of look at the specific funding ratio for each program. That said, we always like to tell folks that, you know, even if you don't receive an award in your first application, it doesn't mean that you will never receive an award. You know, writing for NEH and writing these applications is its own unique beast. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to sort of understand the, you know, the way to write a competitive application, the way to really frame your project in a way that makes sense for NEH funding. And so it could take one or two or three tries before you receive an award. But, you know, we, we like folks to know that it's still worth you know, coming back to us. If you don't receive an award at your first try, come back to us. We give reviewers comments, um, ask for those reviewer comments. We will talk to you about the application process and about your specific application after the review process ended to help you think about how to craft either a stronger project or a stronger proposal um, for to be more competitive the next time around. So, so we do always want folks to know that just because you didn't receive funding once doesn't mean that you should not reapply. We always want folks to come back and reapply, and uh, we're there to work with you throughout that reapplication process. Yes, I I want to second that, amplify that, 
shout that from the mountaintops. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have seen an applicant come in, not receive funding, not contact us and come back with essentially the same application. And it can be sad and frustrating from our perspective because there may be a lot of things that we recognize that are, are very strong about the application, but they've missed the mark in one or two places that we could very easily help them to fill in. Or they didn't ask for reviewer comments and that would have been really helpful to them. Um, or they came into the wrong program and it really was a great application but for a different program. So please don't be too discouraged if you apply and don't receive funding the first, the second, and sometimes even the third time, you know. And I think that's a great reminder of all of us that that applying for grants is a learning opportunity too. You know, I think as someone who served as an NEH reviewer, you write those reviewer comments knowing that the person who put together this grant application is going to see them. Um, and, you know, if you ask for those reviewer comments, you will see the things like exact the exact words that those reviewers input um, when they were evaluating your application. And that can be so valuable as it just gives you this sense of like, okay, if I came in for this again, here, here are the things that I know I would need to improve um, in addition to the feedback that you can get from program officers. So just moving on to the next question, um, I think we've kind of already addressed this one, but I just want to say it. So a large project with multiple pieces could be funded, carved off into like a couple of things, one that could be funded by NEA, for instance, and the other by NEH, uh, performance by the NEA and some interpretive and educational content by NEH, for instance. But even within NEH, you might have a large project where let's say, I'll give the example that, that Adriana and I talked about before we came into this. Um, you might have a project you're doing across your city where you're looking at collecting oral histories that speak to, to how climate change has impacted, say, the parks in your city. And, and you want, that would be one part of it. And, and then you want to preserve and transcribe those oral histories. And then you also want to create a tour where you use those oral histories to interpret how these changes have impacted the culture of the city and you're going to, to make these tours go across the parks in the city. Well, that could be two or three different NEH grants. That could be one NEH grant um, for collecting those oral histories. It, it could be the same one or it could be a different one for preserving and, and, and transcribing those oral histories and a completely different one for in creating interpretation. And we actually like to see that. We like to see that our investment in the project has yielded a gain that you want to expand that project and do more with it. Excellent. Thanks. And that's another great way of thinking about grants, NEH or otherwise, is like, you know, how can you fund pieces of this long-term project, you know, stage to stage, especially using each grant as sort of a building block to the next one, whether it's with the same funder or with another funder, um, because getting one grant can lead to the getting of another grant. Um, we have a more specific question about um, the challenge grant lines. We can get into some of these next week, um, but I wanted to know if those can still be used for building needs such as HVAC. So we will get into that with, with more specifics. We will have a colleague from Challenge Grants joining us. <laughs> um, I know that there are changes coming uh, in the Office of Challenge Grants, and I don't know how they will impact the infrastructure type of projects that they have been funding. Um, but I'm also wondering, Adriana, say yeah. it's back that comes into play in some pna it does so i will say that whereas uh previous challenge grant programs have allowed for hvac that's for a whole building system we do have a more targeted um hvac uh potential funding within preservation and access our sustaining cultural heritage collections programs can fund um hvac uh repair and, and renovation or replacement 
when it is connected to um, specifically meeting the needs of the storage environment of your humanities collections. So um, that's really going to be focused on the needs of storage and the needs of those those items, which is a different environmental need than just say like human comfort in your exhibition areas or your display areas or, or things like that. So um, just to note that it it is a little bit more focused on the needs of collections and how the HVAC repairs or replacements impact that. Um, but that is still available through that program. I know that's a little different than the challenge program where it's it's more broadly for you know new buildings. Um, the other thing is sustaining cultural heritage collections can't fund new building construction, so it couldn't fund like HVAC in a new building. It would have to be for existing structures. Um, and the the funding amount, of course, is is lower. It's a maximum of three hundred and fifty thousand. But um, we do still fund some. We actually fund a lot of HVAC. Uh, in that program. Great. And I hope you can see the value of calling a program officer, right? You know, this is great. Um, there was a, another specific question from Daisha. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, is the page limit inclusive of project members' CVs, which as we know, some humanities scholars can have some rather long CVs. So I will speak specifically to my division, but I think that this is true kind of universally. The page limits are for things like the narrative has a page limit. Um, in my division, we ask that you submit two page CVs. We know <laughs> that scholars' CVs tend to be a lot longer than that. So we ask that you attempt to get a two page CV from them. But if you end up submitting a longer CV from them, it's okay. The page limits are not for the entire application, they are for specific sections. So for example, for an application for an exhibition, we will say the page limit for the narrative is 15 pages. The page limit for the project walkthrough is 15 pages, but that 15 pages actually doesn't include other required parts of that walkthrough, like your exhibition elevations and illustrations. Um, so, it is page limits for particular pieces. Yeah, and that's why it's important to look to at within that chart, which page limits are required and which are recommended because that also shifts as well. So for example, the narrative page limit is a hard fast requirement. That's typically the one where if folks go over that it will get deemed ineligible. Uh, the ones where it deals with attachments, not all of those are exact required. Sometimes those are more recommended and it's a little fuzzier, um, but it's just always good to just look at that chart and really just the details, double check, which is a required, which is a recommended. Great. I want to, we have a few more specific questions, which I'm hopeful maybe you can stay on a couple of minutes to address those. But before we end the recording, um, I think Elizabeth from the Bridgeport History Center has asked a really important question, um, which is more about kind of like emission. Right. What are what are the require? What does NEH think of today? Um, today's requirements for working with materials of national importance. What does materials of national importance mean to the National Endowment of the hum for the Humanities, and how should that affect how people frame their projects? So I'm not sure if that is a question that is specific to um, a certain grant program that focuses on preserving cultural heritage materials. But I will say in general, what we look for in what is of national significance is how you actually interpret that and analyze that. So in your application, you're basically going to argue that to us. If you have a project that is of local importance, it can still have national significance and national resonance. And, and I, I like to emphasize that as well as if it's international. I mean, we fund projects that are about other countries, other cultures, because it's important for people in this country and we're looking at audiences in this country as our focus, but it's important for people in this country to understand that as well. And that is of national significance. But for a local project, what I always say to people is, let's say you're telling the story of 
your local area during World War II. Um, why is your local area representative of what happened across the country? How is it different? Why is it different? And what is it that we understand about our culture or our natural history as a result of that? Or what do we understand about humans as a result of that? That's really what makes something of national significance. It, it's not, um, it's not a question really of intrinsic, oh, this is intrinsically significant and those are the only things that we're going to fund or only projects that you know speak about, I don't know, the constitution. Um, sure, that is important. And you still need to make your case that it's important in your application. Don't just assume, make your case. But if you're talking about, you know, an event that happened in your local area that people in your local area might know about, but I living here in Maryland have never heard of, that can still be something that you make of significance to me as a person in Maryland or, or that I can learn from as a person in Maryland. And that's what we want you to argue in your application. I I 100% agree with what Trisha is saying, and I think that's very true. You know, coming from the excuse me, coming from the collection side of things, it really is is that it's not that things are intrinsically oh well we're only looking at you know Thomas Jefferson's papers and you know it, it's really you know what why is this important you know in your local community in in your region and and how does it connect to and give more information to sort of sort of the national story on a particular topic. So, you know, part of what American Tapestry is really looking at and trying to promote, that initiative is trying to promote, is we have so many, you know, historically, you know, communities that have been excluded from the historical record, communities that are underrepresented in the historical record. And it doesn't mean that they're not important. It means that we as a nation maybe haven't done enough to 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 include these these stories and so you know it's important to show you know why why is this important in our community how does it connect to national stories you know you know some examples and 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 it goes across all different kinds of histories if it's about local history you know even about art history you know don't think it's we're just looking at oh we just you know want to help preserve the you know the really famous you know picassos and 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 Renoirs of and uh, you know or, or you know to some American artists you know with um um you know Warhols and and Rothkos no we're we're looking at you know here's here's a really important regional you know group of regional artists that were really important in this area and they created this this community um you know how to describe their importance in that region and then how that has influenced you know, um, art history and artists across uh, the country and across the world. So it's really about how you tell that story about how this, you know, local or regional or statewide story and 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 community and 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 and, and objects how they tell that regional story and how it connects to broader stories. Um, but it doesn't have to be. It's as, as Trisha said. It's not. It's not just the, you know, the Jefferson Papers. <laughs> That's great. My, I mean, one of my dissertation advisors always referred to this as the so what question, right? You have to answer the so what question. Um, you know, why should I care about this? And I feel like in many ways, that's it, it's where the fun work is of doing this kind of stuff. It's Absolutely. tough. Um, but I would say to folks who feel like they have that they find this a challenge that, you know, this is where pulling in your humanity scholars can be a real help because they may look at it and be like, oh, I didn't know about this story, but I think it connects to this theme and this theme and this theme. And like there's scholarship in this. And, you know, it it might kind of expand the way you might be able to think about something. And that's that's why the NDH and, and Connecticut Humanities ask you to pull in um, subject matter and content experts um, in the field because they'll have a different perspective than you at maybe a collecting institution or interpretive institution. 
Um, we are a few minutes over time from our allotted hour and a half. Um, this has been an incredible presentation with a lot of resources. And thanks to you for including the slide about our next webinar, which is going to be um, a week from today from 1 to 2.30 rather than from 2 to 3.30. Um, I would encourage you folks, if you have questions that were not answered, to either stick around for a couple of minutes um, and maybe you can get those answered directly. Um, but I want to thank... Um, uh, Trisha and Adriana for their incredible presentation and all of the advice and support they've given us, and especially to Connecticut Humanities, um, with whom we partnered to make this event possible. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here and for your excellent questions. We look forward to um, seeing you next week. Well, thank you so much for bringing this up, for suggesting this when we communicated earlier several months ago, and I'm very happy that you brought Connecticut Humanities into this as well. And thank you to everyone for, for coming. And please, I bet you can guess what I'm going to say. Call us. <laughs> yep. Call us or, or email us if you want to start the email route to all of our email addresses besides the ones that we gave in this presentation. All email, all staff, any each staff email is on our website. We, we respond. We pick up the phone and we do answer emails. So please, please reach out to us. <laughs>